welcome to the first edition of Tim's Vino Ventures. Over the course of this series of podcasts, I'm going to be taking you on a very personal tour of some of my favorite wine regions around the world, talking to you about my favorite wines, interviews with either winemakers or wine specialists in those areas, and visiting locations in London where you can actually find these wines. So for our first edition, we are going to go on a wine adventure to Switzerland. And some of you may be asking, why Switzerland? It's not the kind of wine region that just rolls off the tongue. Yes, you might think Burgundy, Bordeaux, Tuscany. Switzerland is a very, very special place. It's somewhere that's close to my heart. I've really fallen in love with this region over the last five years, but was first introduced to it many, many years ago. So let me explain. I now currently work as a business development manager for a Swiss importer and I've had the opportunity of visiting Switzerland and meeting many of the winemakers and it really is a phenomenal country both in terms of the dramatic nature of the vineyards that fall away down to Lake Geneva or Lac Le Mans as the Swiss like to call it or you could be up in the Valais in a vineyard that's just a stone's throw away from the Matterhorn. What you find in Switzerland is a wide variety of grape varieties that you don't find anywhere else in the world and that kind of excites me because after all you know there's lots and lots of chardonnay pinot etc in the world but there's only so much uh, petit darvin cornela chasla we're not going to cover the whole of switzerland but we're going to focus on just four of the canton or sub-regions these are predominantly in the west of the country. So we're going to be looking at uh, wines from Neuchâtel, uh, wines from the canton of Vaux, the Valais, all French speaking. And then we're gonna be heading over the mountains down to the border of Italy and the Italian lakes to the canton of Ticino for something rather special by way of a white Merlot. So we're starting our wine adventure in Geneva because I think all great wine adventures start in this fantastic city. This is a part of Switzerland that is the canton of Vaux. And in the canton of Vaux, Pinot Noir is the most widely planted grape, closely followed by Chasla. And we are going to be tasting one of the wines from this region uh, today. It's the fantastic uh, Aigle Um I'm going to talk a little bit about this wine. As you can imagine, the train is winding its way around the lake. So the canton of Vaux starts just above Geneva winds its way around through a region called La Cotte, which are the lower slopes of the Alps. Lots of Chasse there, lots of fantastic producers, like the, uh, the Domaine Maison Blanche, the White House, uh, producing a wonderful Grand Cru Chasse. And then as we go towards Montreux, the vineyards start to get steeper, and we see the iconic Grand Cru's of Désolé, Calamar, and places like saint Safarat. As we go past uh, Lausanne and towards Montreux, and we're almost at the end of Lake Geneva, we go into the region um, called the Chablais, not to be confused with Chablis, the region of Burgundy, famous for its crisp and mineral uh, Chardonnays. It's the Chablais region. This is the last region, um, sub-region of the Vaux. And this is where some extraordinary good um, Chasla come from. So um, this producer, Baduvin, they are based in Aigle. What makes this particular part of Switzerland so extraordinary? Well, it's a wind phenomena called the Fun. That's with a little o, um, umlaut on the O, the Fun. So the Fun is a wind, is a wind system that normally affects the Valais, it's the, the adjacent canton, but it also extends its influence into the Vaux. It's a drying wind. So in the autumn time, as we're getting towards harvest, when there's a lot of mist around the lake, there's a lot of damp air, the vines are really susceptible um, to rot and botrytis. But here, they don't get affected that because the wind blows away all that disease. So you get these nice, warm, dry evenings that produces a really rich style of chasla. So this is what I'm drinking here. And one of the things you notice when you're actually tasting um, Egg Lemme All Right, it's a richness. It's got that, you can feel the warmth, you can feel the sunshine, the weight, but you've also got these lovely aromatics, um, you know, things like kind of white flowers and chamomile, um, and this lovely kind of buttery, creamy kind of finish in the mouth. It's probably why it's so good um, with fondue. So the current generation of the Badu family is 
Henri Badou. He's at the helm of this wonderful winery. And colloquially, this wine is known as the lizard wine in Switzerland. No, folks, not made from reptiles or lizards. So, you know, it is suitable for vegans and vegetarians. But if you look at the label, you'll see this striking green lizard on the label. That is the emblem, the signature of uh, Aigle. One of my favorite things about the Aigle Mirai wine is some anecdotes that I've picked up across the years. And I think it gives us a sense of how iconic this wine is in Switzerland. Now I'm already wetting your appetite and rather selfishly just enjoying this wonderful glass of Aigle Mirai. But I hear at least some of you through the medium of the internet coming back to me and saying, but where can we find this? Well, let me tell you, there's a lot more Swiss wine out there in the UK and in London than there was 10 years ago. And one of the things that we're going to be doing during this podcast is telling you exactly where in London you can find this wine. So um, our first wine, the wonderful Aigle Mirai, if you happen to be anywhere near Liverpool Street, there's a fabulous new five-star hotel right next door to the um, UBS offices called the Sun Street Hotel. Fabulous restaurant there called Quercus. And on the wine list, you will find this wine. Um, it's a wonderful Apero. So a lot of Brits um, automatically reach for sparkling when it comes to having a pre-dinner drink. If you want to go en Suisse, why not serve a bottle of this? It tunes up the palate. It's got that slight bitterness to it. It's just a brilliant way to get ready for a wonderful gastronomic experience. You'll also find a few other Swiss delights on the list here. A fantastic Pinot Noir, a Blauburgunder from Zurich, um, the super rare Cornelin from the Valais, um, a wonderful um, Eye of the Partridge uh, Rosé, and also the iconic Pinot Noir from Marie-Thérèse Chapasse. Check it out soon. So that's the Vaux. So our next stop on Tim's Vino Ventures is the Valet, just a couple of stops away. And we'll be going to the Chilton Firehouse to find out what amazing Valaisian wines they have. Okay, we're now in the Canton of Valais, which is adjacent to the Canton Vaux. Here, the mountains rise up to dramatic altitudes and we find a very different kind of Chasselas, which we're gonna focus on. It's the home of the fondant. Fondant is the same grape as Chasselas, but it refers to the different style of Chasselas that is made in the Canton of Valais. So it has this lovely spritzy finish, a bit like a kind of vino verde. And that comes from a little of the residual CO2 from the fermentation left in the bottle. It gives you this nice prickle on the tongue, which combined with the wonderful glacial soils of this region, just produces an even more refreshing and mineral style of Chasselas. And nobody, in my opinion, does this better than Gilbes of the iconic Cave Jean René Germanier. Now, this delicious wine you can have by the bottle here at the iconic Chilton Firehouse. So this estate has been going for over 100 years. It's now run by an uncle and uh, his nephew. Uh, Jean-René is the uncle, Gilles is the nephew. But they're actually more like cousins. They're only about 10 years difference in age group. Gilles said to me the last time I was chatting to him, I said, you know, what, what, you know what's so special about Chasselas and Fondant? And he said, well, it's, it's kind of in the culture of Switzerland. You know, in England, two friends might say, you know, we're going for a beer after work. But in Switzerland, two friends may come out of their Swiss bank or their office and say, hey, should we go for a glass of Chasselas? Should we go for a Fondant? It means essentially going for a drink. It's part of their cultural DNA. And what a wonderful Apero style drink it is, as well as an iconic wine to have with your cheese fondue or your lac de pêche, your lake perch, the little small fried fish that we have from Lac Le Mat. One of the other things that I've, I've learned from my many conversations with Gilles is the importance of Chasselas to the reputation of a winemaker in Switzerland. And I said to Gilles, you know, how do the Swiss judge how good a winemaker is? Surely it's by how they make their best wine. And he said, oh no, it is not this team. It is much more complex. It's how good the Chasselas is. And I said, okay, enlighten me. 
and he said, Chasselin is a wonderful wine, or Fondo is a wonderful wine, but it requires a high enological skill to make it, to bring out all the nuances and the character of this wine. And so how you make it is how good a winemaker you're judged by. So people don't look at your wine that retails for maybe 50 or 100 pounds. They look at how good your wine is and where you rank in the Mondial, Mondial de Chasselas, the World Cup of Chasselas, you know, the league table of the best Chasselas. That's your calling card, that's your signature. And I have to say, this is one of the best. So I also wanted to say a little bit more about the Chiltern Firehouse. You know, a beloved restaurant of um, celebrity A-listers, an iconic place to drink, a uh, wonderful wine list. You can find some fabulous Swiss wines here, including the seminal Kayas made by um, Gilles Best, which for me is the ultimate expression of uh, Rhone Syrah. Um, this is aged for two years in small uh, French Oberiques and recently won best Syrah in the world between 50 and 75 pounds. So if you like your own Syrahs, check out the Kayas at the Chilton Firehouse. It's amazing. They also have some wonderful wines by the iconic biodynamic winemaker Marie Therese Chapaz. So this is the uh, Fond de la Terrasse uh, from Cab Jean René Germanier, uh, one of the iconic fondants of Switzerland. Do you want to do a video with that oh, one as well? Hello. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just here on the street and this very Swiss sounding gentleman has just come up to me with another wine by the same iconic winemaker, which also happens to be one of my favorite wines from Gilles Bess. This is the super mineral saline Petit Davin, one of the iconic wines um, of one of the great varieties of Switzerland. It's fantastic. It's my go-to Swiss wine with shellfish and seafood. Wonderful. Um, enchanté. David. Uh, Tim. Nice uh, to meet you. And you're a big fan of Cab Jean René yeah, de I actually just brought it back from uh, Valais oh. uh, last weekend, so. I like a man who walks around with a Swiss wine in his <laughs> yeah. bag. I'm doing your fondue tonight, that's Oh, right. perfect, that perfect. So. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, <laughs> have a nice day. Take care, cheers. <laughs> so we'll be wrapping up here now at Chilton Firehouse and moving on to our last of our French-speaking cantons, the canton of Neuchâtel and the Three Lakes, or so Neuchâtel et Trois Lacs, where we'll be looking to taste a wine from the Domaine de Montmelon at the fabulous organic wine bar, Lady of the Grapes. As they say en français, nous sommes arrivés. We are at Lady of the Grapes and we are at Neuchâtel and the Trois Lacs. So, our next wine is a red wine called Extra Muros. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the producer. It's Domaine de Montmelon. It's along the uh, western shore of uh, Lac Neuchâtel. And that's right on the kind of the French border there. Slightly lower in terms of altitude. The domain's been in the family for five generations and it's now brother and sister, Rachel and Benoit, that are running the winery. They are fully organic, so there's no herbicides, pesticides used. Um, and they're producing beautiful, pure wines, uh, fantastic Pinot Noir, rosé of Pinot Noir, beautiful uh, Chasselas, which they call it Vernier. But for me, the wine that really does it is the Extra Muros. Now, Extra Muros is an amazing wine. It's 40% Gamma Ray, 40% Garin Noir, and just 20% Pinot Noir. And before you guys do a double take, and say, what did he just say? Gamma Ray, Gara Noir. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these two new grape varieties, which were created in the Swiss Viticultural Institute, Agroscope. But before I do that, I'm just gonna have my first sip of Extra Muros. Spicy, a nice little bit of Garik, that kind of Mediterranean herbs lovely red and dark fruits. Okay, so back to the Gamma Ray and the Garin Noir. What are they? Well, they are sibling varieties. That means they have the same parents, the same genetic material was used. And that genetic material was Gamay, the great grape of Beaujolais, and Richensteiner, a white grape. So the clever guys at Agroscope, the Swiss Viticultural Institute, were charged with making a new grape variety. And so they crossed the DNA of those two grape varieties I mentioned and produced new 
new offspring, yes. new viable vines that could produce grapes. And they ended up with Gamma Ray and Gamma Noir. So although the parents are the same, they ended up with two completely different grape varieties. Now the Gamma Noir has a little more kind of blueberry, a little more nutmeg and a bit of cherry and a bit of like blackberry. And the Gamma Ray is a lot more kind of blackberry, black currant, red cherry, and a little bit of black pepper spice. Blend them together, as is often done in Switzerland, and they're beautiful. Add in a bit of Pinot, and you get a really exceptional wine, as here in the Extra Muros. Now, this, these great varieties were only created in the late 1970s and came to be planted in 1982. So they're quite a new phenomena, but I would thoroughly commend you to try wines from these great varieties. They're super approachable, super soft, silky tannins, and a wonderful food wine. Now something quite magical happens here with the winemaking. So the complexity I think comes from the fact that these grapes are all vinified separately and then they take um, each parcel of grapes and it's put into a mixture of different styles of oak barrel. Why do they do that? Well, oak barrels, when you first use them, they're really toasty or very oaky, and that can give off a lot of tannin in the wine. The more times that you put wine in a barrel, the softer those aromas become, until after you've done it three times, there's virtually no taste of oak at all. You've just got what we call microoxygenation, just this gentle, smooth breathing through the wood. So here, the winemakers, Benoit and his um, sister Rachel, have used a mixture of new, so that's brand new barrels, second fill, those that are like one year old, um, third fill, those that are two years old, and third fill barrels, so four year old barrels, and 25% in each. And this really ends up with lots of different components and levels of complexity that makes this wine so wonderful. So as I said, you can drink this wine here, at Lady of the Grapes, along with some wonderful wines from the iconic marie Therese Chapin. Um, they also have two other wines from Domaine de Montmelon and some other wines from female Swiss winemakers. It's in the heart of Covent Garden, so it's really convenient for theatre land or if you're having a stroll along the north bank of the river. Um, some wonderful small plates. Do come and have a look at the wonderful cuisine um, here at Lady of the Grapes. Cheers. So on any wine adventure, it's really important to take a break from the all-important business of tasting and talking about wine and just having a little cheese and charcuterie to actually, you know, revive, revive the soul. So here we are at the newly opened farm shop here in Mayfair. But here you have everything that you'd find in a fantastic uh, farm shop Beautiful butchery, charcuterie, wonderful artisan cheeses, but also an amazing selection of Swiss wines, including a wine bar where you can drink these Swiss wines um, by the glass uh, and also enjoy some iconic farmhouse cheeses and charcuterie. So um, the wine that I really want to talk about in the context of the farm shop is the second wine that we're going to be featuring from the Valais. It's also by Gilles of the can of Jean-René Germanier, and it really is a spectacular wine. It is the Clos de la Couta Haider de Vey. A bit of a mouthful, I'm sure you, you, you're thinking. So what is it? It's high altitude Sauvignon. Sauvignon's a grape that some of you may have come across uh, from the Jura, where it's always um, made in an oxidative style. That means it's aged under a layer of floor. It has this kind of like nutty, yeasty, almost kind of sherry-like quality to it, the most famous of which is the Chateau Chalon. This, however, is the complete unoxidized version. So it's kind of clean, it's fresher, but it has some weight and texture. This particular example has 10 months uh, on the lees and six months of batonnage so that it's been enriched and stirred through. And it's a fantastic wine to have with any kind of hard cheeses, um, but it also works well with things like your roast chicken, your stronger grilled fish, um, and it's a wonderful wine. 
But let me tell you a little bit about the wine because it's a wine that I was captivated by the story of how it came about. And it started off up in the Val de Hera, which is a uh, part of the valley, very close to the Matterhorn. There's a tiny commune in the village of Ve, that's V-E-X. And this village had its own communal or community vineyard, which as the village uh, population grew elder or older, they were unable to um, work these precipitously steep slopes, which went from around 400 to 650 meters. And so the vineyard fell into disrepair and to decay. It had never had any kind of chemicals used on it, so it was completely organic. And then the village elders were faced with a dilemma. They had this beautiful vineyard. It was basically kind of decaying. And so they approached Gilles Bess, who's the head winemaker at Cave Jean Romagné, and they said, will you help us? Will you help us restore it? And so the quid pro quo was they took a long lease on this. They completely restored it to its former glory. And they planted just two varieties there. It was the Swiss national holiday. All the restaurants were fully booked. And so Gilles said, uh, ah, I know, perhaps we have uh, the picnic in the Clos de la Couta. And let me tell you, um, listeners, this was way better than going to a Michelin-starred restaurant. It's this most beautiful location. Gilles got some uh, charcuterie and some cheese. And my wife, Gillian, and I, we headed up in his four-wheel drive up into the mountains. And he's got a little picnic table under the kind of the blaring Valaisian sun. And we set up there and we enjoyed this wine with our, with our charcuterie and our cheese, looking out across the vines. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to share some pictures of this uh, with you uh, on the podcast because it's absolutely iconic. Um, and that was my, you know, that was my seminal moment in terms of the Clos de la Cusa. And it's also where I got to enjoy that wonderful 20-year-old um, Fondant Les Terrasse. So we are now cruising through the Saint-Gothard Tunnel. We've been to the Vaux, the Valais, the Neuchâtel, the best that the French wine-speaking regions of Switzerland can offer us. But we're not done, because there's one canton in Switzerland that is exclusively Italian, by which it identifies with Italy, it has Italian as its primary language, and it is also the home of the great Merlots of Switzerland. We're talking Ticino, beautiful canton, two amazing lakes, Maggiore and Lake Lugano, and as I said, the home of Swiss Merlot. In fact, 80% of all the grape varieties grown in Ticino are Merlot. And I say grape varieties, it's just one variety. However, at least 20% of that 80% are turned into white wines. Shock! Newsflash, I hear you guys say. Now the thing is, most red wines or red grapes produce white juice. They take their colour from the skins of the grapes. Think those amazing Blanc de Noir champagnes that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. No, no. This is the Guido Brivio Bianco Rivere. Oh my goodness me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is quite an exceptional white Merlot. And it's one that, on appearance, you might just dismiss. Now, I'm not sure if the light's going to pick this up, but I'm going to hold the glass up to the camera. And what you'll see is a very pale, very, very pale liquid in the glass. So pale, in fact, that one might think it's a pale, insipid wine from a very cool climate. And yet, when one puts one's nose in the glass, gives it a swirlage, I'm sure some of you have heard that term before, something altogether heady and aromatic is going on. And that's because these white Merlot juice, or this white Merlot juice, has been fermented and matured in small French oak barriques. Eight months, brand new French oak barrels. The wine is the brainchild of Guido Brivio, who's recently retired 
Um, his winery stake has now been sold to the Gialdi family, but the wine continues to be made under the Brivio label. Um, and Guido grew up in a, in, a, in a drinks family, a family that um, had investments in a large number of um, brands in Switzerland. But his interest was in wine. He went to wine school. He learned how to be a winemaker. He had some money. He loved Burgundy. And he wanted to make a white wine in Switzerland from his beloved red Merlot grapes. Um, that could rival some of the great wines of Burgundy. And so he set about producing Bianco Rivera. It's quite extraordinary. So as I say, on, on the nose, straight away, you get this unmistakable um, kind of like um, toasty like hazelnut character. You also get this kind of yellow plum characteristic that is very much synonymous with um, white wines made from, um, from Merlot grapes. On the palate, The wine's still very young, but we're getting a little bit of that kind of toast, a little caramel coming through. Very smooth. This wine is going to get better and better with age. It will also add a little bit of color. Um, but this is the 2022, which is drinking absolutely um, on point right now. Um, if you're on your wine travels and you've traveled through the San Gotthard Tunnel and you're heading down um, either to the south uh, of Ticino, to the wonderful Maggiore, maybe to Locarno for the film festival, or to the wonderful uh, Lake Lugano where you can cruise around um, on the lakes and drink wonderful Swiss wines. Um, you might also like to visit this winery. They've got a wonderful cellar door, beautiful location in the quaint little town of Mendricio. Um, it really is quite magical, and you'll be able to taste a phenomenal range um, of wines um, from the Brivio brand. Um, ones I can recommend, their entry-level Merlot Bioco is um, stunning, but uh, you should also look out for wines like um, their premium Sassi Grossi. So um, we are at probably um, almost the end of our first uh, podcast, and I haven't said too much about our location. We are in probably one of the most iconic restaurant buildings in London. Uh, the former Michelin uh, tyre headquarters, um, now home to the unmistakable signature two-star Michelin chef, Claude Bossi at Bibendum. It really is one of the most stunning buildings and obviously uh, stands up to Claude's amazing uh, cuisine. Absolutely delighted um, to see a number of Swiss wines uh, on the list here including the iconic Bianco Rivera. This is in large part due to the head sommelier, uh, Elio, uh, Elio Machinet, um, who is um, a phenomenal sommelier and uh, was one of the first to spot this uh, iconic wine and get it listed here uh, at Claude Bosse. You will also find wines from the iconic Marie-Thérèse Chopin, a uh, biodynamic producer from the Valais, um, amongst others, Carve Jean and Germanier. Um, and occasionally you'll find special wine pairings on Wines by the Glass. If you're interested in Swiss wine, this is definitely somewhere that you should come and enjoy a fine dining experience in the beautiful surroundings um, of this um, iconic historic building um, in South Kensington. I'd like to just take a few moments now just to cast our minds back to our, our Swiss wine journey. There's not much available um, for export. We know this, there's hard, they, export maybe 2%. We we'll probably get about half a percent of that in the UK. There's more of it on distribution. It's rare, it's interesting, it's wonderful. We've seen some iconic restaurants around London um, listing these wines. When you see Swiss wines on a list, it's a really good indicator of how much care um, the sommelier is taking and a good indicator of the establishment because they've sought these rare and interesting wines out. Um, so I hope you have as much fun as discovering and enjoying these wines as I do. I'm really looking forward um, to taking you on Tim's um, Vino Ventures. And if you'd like to find out a little bit more um, before the next podcast, do give me a follow uh, on Instagram. You can find me at Tim's Food and Wine Travels or uh, on my website, www.timsfoodandwinetravels.com. Um, also, a huge big thanks to Andrew Greening and Greenings uh, for their patronage and support and sponsorship 
of this podcast. It really is a joy to work with Greenings. I've had the pleasure of hosting a number of dinners, um, which I've met many of you at, and really looking forward to working with Greenings again over the next 12 months and bringing you more stories of wine. In the meantime, take care and drink well.